when we used to sit outside, not under canvas, with our brollies up when it rained and listen to the good news of Jesus. Hello, my name is Esther. And my name is Daniel. How have you felt in lockdown? I felt really comfortable and relaxed. I felt really tired and exhausted from doing all those P with Joe workouts. Is there anything that you've enjoyed? I've really enjoyed not being stuck to a strict schedule at school. I've really enjoyed having time to play with my sister. Is there anything you haven't liked? I've missed my friends. I've missed my friends too. Have you found ways of coping? Zoom is really handy for meeting our friends online. Are there any other ways? I've found that when my teacher calls me once a week, it really helps. I've found Girls Brigade is really nice to do because we all do things together and we get a lot of things done. Have you got any other top tips? I have these daily readings and they're quite helpful. Today's is Rejoice, Be Glad and Repeat. On Sundays, because we cannot attend church, we light this candle and say that our thanks to God. Bye. Bye. Hello. I'm Becky. My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student. I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. I'm Ian White and I'm the senior tutor of the college and from a very blowy garden in Sheffield I have two things linked to Clip College just behind me and to Clip College anniversary celebration that became Cliff College Festival. Anybody recognise these from Cliff College Terrace many many years ago when we used to sit outside not under canvas Hello. with our brollies up when it rained and listen to the good news of Jesus. Hi, I'm Izzy. I study the BA Mission and Ministry course here at Cliff College. I am in my second year studying part-time. Um, I've been a youth pastor for 18 months now, the same, um, roughly the same amount of time I've been studying at Cliff. Um, during the summer we went through um, a real time of feeling like God was calling us to um, some transition, transition, some change um, in our ministry and we were praying and worshipping and just kind of digging, digging into scriptures to see what, what God had for us. And um, it was actually during my teaching week in November at Cliff where I really felt like God had kind of pulled some stuff up and was, was calling us into um, some solid transition and some solid change. Um, and it was because on the week um, we were talking about a mission, an intergenerational church. And the way our, way our youth group was running, we had two separate youth groups at the time, and we felt like God wanted to bring unity to our, to our ministry, to our youth group, but also unity in our church. And we found that the best way to do that was to just stick everyone together. Um, but during the week here, 
Um, Tim Goff was one of our lecturers. He's a great guy and he's written a great book. And he kind of went into the lectures really expecting some, some kind of inspirational stuff. And if I'm being honest, I, I came out of the week feeling really stretched and pulled and challenged and basically just had a lot on my mind. Um, in the week after though, having kind of reflected on what did God want to do with this, um, this challenge of unity and also reflecting on basically all that Tim had said. Um, I kind of came to the realization through prayer that um, we should basically just get on with it. We should um, push through into um, wanting to build and create a space for young people to um, come to a church where they can be a part of it. Like I said, during the time of um, praying and pushing in and worshiping and reading scripture to see what God was wanting to call us into, um, we were, as a team, we were wondering what um, the wider church would say or what the staff team would even say, but actually we really felt that God was totally on board and some of the decisions that we made we made actually didn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people in in the church um, but there was just a sense of calling like this ministry needs to change and we need some we need a wave of God and so um, most of our team were pretty much on board with the idea um, they were really energetic and enthusiastic and we were able to then e recruit even more team because we had a we had a clearer vision um, and we also were willing to take more risks and I think there's something really fun and there's a lot of energy in taking a risk um, when it comes to kind of doing it in the name of Jesus and also our staff team were really on board and Tim's teaching and the course here it, it stretches and it pulls but also it, um, challenges in the right areas in ministry and we have seen amazing fruit from it we've seen um, our young people um, set the tone and raise the bar for how we worship in our church and how we pray in our church and ultimately how we come together and we unite um, as friends and church family and we've got young people who are um, who haven't experienced leading worship before just kind of going for it because they've been able to experience the older youth um, run with it and try it and take a risk um, because yeah we just know that Jesus gives them confidence. Hi friends, it's Veronica from Cliff College. You might know me from festival where I'm running around the campsite or running the mocktail bar. This year we're excited to bring you a fun-filled, worship-packed weekend through festival at home. Friends, we serve a heavenly father who loves to connect with us. And that's why I hope that you'll find some time this bank holiday weekend to find meaningful connection through festival online. God bless you, and we look forward to Festival 2021, where we'll get to see you in person. Hello, I'm Ian White, and I'm the senior tutor of the college, and from a very blowy garden in Sheffield, I have two things linked to Cliff College just behind me, and to Cliff College anniversary celebration that became Cliff College Festival. Anybody recognize these from Cliff College Terrace many, many years ago, when we used to sit outside not under canvas, with our brollies up when it rained, and listen to the good news of Jesus. Hello, 
my name is Esther. <laughs> my name is Daniel. How have you felt in lockdown? I felt really comfortable and relaxed. I felt really tired and exhausted from doing all those P with Joe workouts. Is there anything that you've enjoyed? I've really enjoyed not being stuck to a strict schedule at school. I've really enjoyed having time to play with my sister. Is there anything you haven't liked? I've missed my friends. I've missed my friends too. Have you found ways of coping? Zoom is really handy for meeting our friends online. Are there any other ways? I've found that when my teacher calls me once a week, it really helps. I found Girls Brigade is really nice to do because we all do things together and we get a lot of things done. Have you got any other top tips? I have these daily readings and they're quite helpful. Today's is rejoice, be glad and repeat. On Sundays, because we cannot attend church, we light this candle and say that our thanks to God. Bye. Bye. Hello. I'm Becky. My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student. I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. Festival viewers. Our seminar speaker for this session is award-winning scholar activist Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Miguel has focused his academic career on the pursuit of social ethics 
within contemporary U.S. thought. He specifically looks at how religion affects racism, class, and gender oppression. Over the course of the weekend, Miguel will take us on a journey of hope, asking tough questions and giving us some even tougher answers. I introduce to you Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, Dr. Miguel De La Torre. Hello. My name is Miguel De La Torre. I am the Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at the Iliff School of Theology located in Denver, Colorado on the Denver University campus. I come to you today literally in the midst of a lockdown. Our country, because of the coronavirus, um, has ordered us to shelter in place. Literally as I'm speaking to you today, the angel of death is roaming not only the United States, but also the world. And today, 2020, has some similarities to the plague that ravished Europe in 1347 and ravished England in 1665. For you see, those who were more susceptible to getting ill, to dying, are those who are the poorest among us. We say to each other that we're all in this together, that this plague does not discriminate, that anyone could get it and anyone could die. And, and for the most part, that is true. However, as we look at the numbers and the demographics of those who are dying, it becomes very obvious that if you are a person of color, if you are a migrant, if you are among the least of these, my brethren, you have a disproportionate higher rate of uh, getting the disease and dying from the disease. For you see, whether it be in 1347 or 1665 or 2020, the rich and the wealthy can always escape to their country homes, to their yachts, to their private house out in the country or in an estate and escape the crowdedness and, 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 and the, the center of where these pandemics are exploding with deadly um, consequences. The poor can never leave. They are still stuck. The better off, the wealthy, including myself, who am not wealthy, but have a certain degree of middle class privilege, can work out of my home, as I'm doing now by recording this presentation. But for the vast majority of, of, of the poor, they have no choice but to do those type of jobs that exposes them in greater numbers to the virus. So you see, I can have hope that this will all work out because I have a certain degree of middle class privilege. But for those who are the least of these, the choice is either between making money to eat and feed your children or risking your life and getting the coronavirus so that you could get paid and feed your children. So part of the conversation we should be examining is how does this virus intersect with economic privilege? Before this pandemic hit the earth, there's another pandemic that we were suffering from, but yet never really even bother to recognize or to examine. And, and this is the pandemic of neoliberalism. For you see, every day, 25,000 children die of hunger and preventable diseases uh, throughout the world. 
25,000 children a day of preventable disease and of hunger. And yet those numbers are ignored. And in this pandemic of the coronavirus, we're literally counting pretty much every life that is lost. Why do those lives not matter as much as the lives that are being taken by the coronavirus? And I mean, part of the answer is because those lives are predominantly, if not all, comprised of those who are the least among us. And they come from the underside of history. You see, it's very easy to have hope this side of the resurrection. Uh, on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, which we celebrated just a few weeks ago, it's very easy to, to have hope and new life for a good future. Privilege, economic privilege allows for that. But when all you know is death and the gore of crucifixion, it's sometimes hard to imagine that there will even be a Sunday. So I have to ask, is hope a middle-class privilege? Now, now I, I know what some of you are thinking. He's like, wait a minute, hold on. Hope is, is one of the fruits of the spirit along with love and joy. Um, how can it be a privilege? But, but, but hear me out. The way we have structure our society, there is no hope for those who are the most marginalized among us. For them, the end more than likely would be death. So my question for today is how do we embrace the hopelessness as an act of solidarity with those who are the least among us? I would argue that all Eurocentric, enlightened, philosophical, and theological thought is detrimental to the poor and to communities of color. And therefore, they have to be rejected if we seek salvation. For you see, if we look for salvation among the very structures that have created the justification for our oppression, then we will never find liberation. For when the French cried out, liberté, égalité, and fraternité, they never intended for this slogan to encompass their colonial subjects in Haiti, in Algiers, or in Vietnam. For you see, these enlightened concepts of liberty and equality and fraternity was only, only for white French people. Everyone else was excluded. So if I was a Eurocentric thinker, the challenge before me is how do I create a theological way of thinking that excludes the vast majority of the world's poor while at the same time holding on to these rhetoric of liberty and justice for all. When I was a child in the first grade, uh, we would uh, begin every day by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And for those of you unfamiliar with the U.S. Pledge of Allegiance, the last sentence of the pledge is, with liberty and justice for all. And yet, as a small child, I knew that, that that phrase did not apply to me. That liberty and justice was not for this Latino kid from the barrios. When a child abuser 
and rapists wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator. The writer of those words never intended to include their black slaves. And anyone in 1776 who read those words knew that the black population and the Indian population of the time was not included in that phrase. So when I hear words about hope, this has become one of those rhetorics which is preached by those with middle class privilege, unaware that the very structures they've created and from which they benefit have eliminated all concepts of hope for the vast majority of those on the underside of history. So, one of the reasons or one of the ways in which I have moved away from hope is by rejecting Hegel's uh, movement of history. Uh, and, and I don't want to get into a technical philosophical conversation, but for those of you who, who have read Hegel, um, you're familiar that for him, history moves from east to west. Um, history goes through stages of the dialectic in where each stage moves history to a higher plateau. So history is both linear and moves in an upward direction. So yesterday may have been horrible, but the future will be so much better as we move closer to, to, to a, a utopian type of existence. Now for Hegel, as history moves through the world, um, it, it may begin in Asia, but it totally skips Africa. It skips um, the indigenous people in the so-called new world. It skips French because it has been so Africanized. And, and the reason these areas and peoples are skipped is because they are too inferior which creates the right man's burden of bringing history, salvation, civilization, and Christianization to those who are on the margins of history, the white man's burden. So the salvation history is not just a biblical term, it's also an economic term, whether it be Karl Marx or rather it be Adam Smith, both are children of modernity and both embrace this idea that economic um, structures will continue to move upward until we reach an utopia, whether it being the communist utopia of the withering away of the state or Adam Smith's utopia in where everyone seeking self-interest will cause all the ships to rise with a, with a rising um, tide. However, what if Michel Foucault is correct when he argues that history is neither linear nor does it have a purpose or a reason? What if history is nothing but disconnected points of time that I basically try to sew together to create a pattern that helps make uh, meaning of what's going on now and justify what I hope for the future. It, it's kind of like um, every so often um, we find Jesus' face on a tortilla someplace. And somebody says, oh, look, here's a tortilla. And look at Jesus' face. Isn't this exciting? Uh, studies have been done um, in a Korean lab in where they notice, um, you know, uh, the brain waves of humans that um, when we see static and, um, images, when we see images that have nothing but um, different types of um, static um, um, images upon it, um, we usually find a face in that image. Um, our brains are, are wired to look for something familiar like a face in 
in, in an image that has no um, recognizable um, image in it. I would argue in the same way, we look at the disjointed and disconnection of history and we place upon it the face of Jesus. And we see, oh, look, see the way history is moving? See, God has always moved history towards a future. If this is true, then Mary, when Martin Luther King Jr. said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, maybe the arc of the, uni of the moral universe could care less which way it bends. The future could be just, or the future could be a total dis, uh, dysopia, uh, dis, dysopia. The future could be um, something that is better than today, or it could be worse. So it's not that the arc of the moral universe is bent towards justice, but rather if it's going to bend at all, it is us who have to do the bending. The reason we have hope is because we believe that at the end of history, we're gonna basically be able to look back and say, oh, I see all those horrible things. I see God's hand in all those things that happened in the past that all make sense to me now. But, but, but let me be very clear. Colonialism, slavery, genocide, massacre, concentration camps, none of it makes sense. None of it can ever be justified. These were all moments of madness, which are part of who we are as humans. And the moment that we start justifying these horrible past historical events, as a way towards a utopian future, we really begin to lose, I think, our very moral compass. We'll talk more about history and, 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 and this embracement of hopelessness in, in the next section. But for now, I wanna move towards the decolonization of my very mind. You see, before I really begin to examine how the social structures are designed to maintain and sustain oppression, I have to begin with the act of decolonizing my own mind. Um, and let me give you an example. Uh, when I was a young man, um, in my early 20s, uh, my hair was down to about here at the time. Um, I drove from Miami, Florida, up to New York City, uh, about a two-day drive back in the um, mid, mid to late 1970s. As I was driving up north, I got pulled over by the police. The police then asked me, can they search my vehicle? To which I said, sure, no problem, I have nothing to hide. So they search my vehicle, and when they finish, I ask the police officer, I'm curious, what, what are you looking for? And, and his response was, well, you see, Latino men from South Florida are usually suspected of trafficking in cocaine and bringing it up to New York City. So we were just basically checking. And then it was before racial profiling was um, re well recognized in, in this country, um, I was being racially profiled. But here's the thing, as I drove away, what went through my mind was not indignation that I was being stopped and searched, but instead I was saying to myself, Thank God that the cops are doing their job in, in keeping our country safe. You see, my mind was so colonized that I was seeing myself through the eyes of my oppressor. I was defining my identity 
through the very um, way that those of the dominant culture see and define my identity. The very first step of any process of liberation must begin with the decolonization of my own mind. How do I learn ethics, theology, biblical studies through my own eyes and through my own thinking? And part of that, as I am arguing today, is rejecting this Eurocentric middle-class privilege known as hope and instead embracing hopelessness. The, one of the reasons why this is important is that the hope that it's all going to work out, that my treasures are going to be in heaven, provides a spirituality that basically domesticates me rather than my seeking uh, physical liberation. I begin to believe that the riches are for the hereafter and not for the here and now, thus ignoring John 10.10 10, that I have come to give life and give life abundantly. You see, our minds are so colonized that I believe it makes God vomit. So the first act is I need to begin to decolonize my mind. And I do that by um, seeing reality, not only through my own eyes, but using my own symbols by which to define reality. One of my intellectual mentors, Jose Mati, once said, el platano, uh, I'm sorry, el vino de platano, y si sale agrio, sigue siendo nuestro vino. Uh, to translate to those who have yet learned the, angu the language of the angels, um, let me, let, let me um, translate what he said. Uh, Jose Mati said, we will make our wine out of plantains, and even if it comes out sour, it is still our wine. You see, I have been taught to look at God, to look at the Bible, to look at theology, to understand the spiritual, using the symbols of a dominant culture who created those very symbols to exclude me and to justify the oppression of my people. So for me to seek liberation using the tools of the master only reinforces my liberation, my, my, my um, oppression and my domination. If I truly seek liberation, I must learn how to make my own wine out of my own indigenous plantains. And it doesn't matter if it comes out sour. It doesn't matter if I get it wrong. It doesn't matter if it doesn't taste all that good because it is mine and because it represents my culture. It is more sweeter and it is uh, more delicious than the bitter wine of the dominant culture. How do I reject the dominant culture's philosophical, theological, enlightened way of uh, framing the world around me? We will look at this over the next two sessions. But, but for now, let me at least um, begin by saying that, that, that the answer is really has to be contextual. That is, we must do our theology from the grassroots, my grassroots, not the grassroots of the empire, not the grassroots of the dominant culture, but the grassroots of my marginalized people. One of the fallacies that the dominant culture has impose upon how we do theology and how we do uh, philosophical work is that their subjective 
view of the world becomes objective for everyone else. My views, my subjective views, always remain subjective. An interesting um, interpretation, an interesting um, uh, view of uh, point of view. But you see, real theology, uh, real philosophical thought is Eurocentric because it is objective. That's a lie. It's just as subjective as my views. All of it comes from a particular social context and a social location. The difference is they have the power, both through the educational system, um, by, the, by the churches um, that they occupy, they have the power to normalize and legitimize their objective views and making it subject, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, legitimizing their subjective views and making them objective for the rest of the world. So I have to begin by understanding that this idea of truth residing in the center of empire uh, for Hegel, it happened to have been central Germany, where he was from. But, but, but for, for, for me to reject this um, objectivity of the empire and the colonizer um, really becomes that first step of decolonizing my mind. And, and part of that, as I will be arguing um, over the next two sessions, um, is embracing the hopelessness in which the vast majority of the world's population who are of color and who are, of poor, who are poor find themselves in. And I want to say just one last thing about today's conversation and the next two that I will be doing. My audience is not necessarily you. I am speaking to those of you who are listening to me, who are oppressed, who are repressed. I'm speaking to the disenfranchised, the dispossessed, and the disinherited. I am speaking to communities of color. I am speaking to the poor. I am speaking to the marginalized. Though, those are who my audience is. And if you are not part of that audience, you have the privilege of listening into my conversation with them. So, so my objective is not to convince you to, to agree with me. I, I really could care less. My objective is to raise the consciousness of those who are the oppressed and the marginalized of the world so they could begin to, to see reality through their own mind, eyes and through their own decolonized mind, rather than using the lens of Eurocentric um, so-called objective superiority. So I want to be very clear also as to who my audience is today in this lecture and for the next two that we will be doing. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, we will continue um, um, this discussion in the next two lectures.